Hello, my name is Raquel. In order to buy or sell, you have to have the money of the beast on your mind or in your hand. And that's one of the things in the Bible that's not translated correctly. It's in the apocalypse. And uh, there's another word they don't translate correctly. The word man, and Jesus Christ said you can't serve God or money. You'll either love the one or hate the other and hold to the one or despise the other. And mammon is an Aramaic word for money, and they don't want to tell you that. But here it is, the kerygma of the beast. And by yourselves, there's the word. It's a Greek word, a classical Greek word. And uh, here you can see the Liddell Scott Unabridged Greek Lexicon. And it's a very kind of rare book. Only, like, university libraries have it. I'm not sure if the Tucson City Library has it. But there's the same word, kerygma. And that, there it is again. And like, um, it means the impress on coin. And then the second definition is stamp money or coin. And then Antipater Thessalonius was um, living at about the same time that the book of Revelation was written. And so, and Plutarch was too. And there you can see this is, it met a stamp document also in the first, first century. But that's later, actually, so, so it changed. And then it became the brand on the camel in the second century, because the words evolve over time. And they, they made like a special thing up here. The serpent's bite, its sting. And, uh, but the, and then they put the apocalypse up there. I don't know why they put that like that, because you can see the whole context is that, you know, no one buys themselves without the money. It's obviously money. But, but they don't want to tell you that. It's just like uh, I was telling you about, you know, Jesus Christ. He says you can't serve God or man and, uh, because you'll either love the one and hate the other, hold the one besides the other, despise the other. But the Pharisees who loved money heard all this and scoffed, and that's in Luke, you know. I think Jesus Christ was a really good philosopher. And they use a different word here that means literally fond of silver. And uh, you can see the whole context, you know, when money is a thing of the past. Uh, he, it's all like, you know, doing, dealing with money. And then he tells his disciples to go forth without uh, brass or script in your purse. Uh, Ezekiel said it's going to become an unclean thing. And that money is the stumbling block of their iniquity. It's, uh, let's see what else we got here. Oh, yeah, Karl Marx, well, Friedrich Engels was a partner of uh, Karl Marx. And Muammar Gaddafi also says practically the same things that uh, Friedrich Engels wrote. And Nikola Bukharin was a contemporary of Lenin, and uh, he helped found the communist system over there. And then Stalin finally executed him in a big show trial. But he believed in eliminating money. And there wouldn't be any barter or work credits either because, like they say up here, when, uh, you know, when, there's a, when there's an abundance, when the level of material needs of the society, you know, profit and automatically disappear because there'll be an abundance. And that's kind of like uh, what uh, Bertland Russell said. Bertland Russell was like a British mathematician and he was also an anarchist. And he believed that, you know, when there's uh, plenty of things to go around, then they might as well be given out for free because uh, it's not just not practical to hoard food because it's going to spoil. And there'd be a lot of food for everybody if people didn't eat, eat meat, a lot of the corn that they... Uh... I wonder if I got this thing on shuffle or not. Let's see. Yeah, I'll skip this one. I don't like it too much. Uh, here's something from Madonna. All right, what else we got here? Oh yeah, Karl Marx believed in eliminating money. He had a thing called On the Jewish Question, Part 2, The Capacity of Present-Day Jews and Christians to Obtain Freedom. And uh, he talks about the God of the Jews being money. And then he says that uh, emancipation from huckstering and money, consequently from practical real Judaism, would be the self-emancipation of our time. And then uh, he says that uh, money is the jealous God of Israel in the face of which no other God may exist. Money degrades all the gods of man and turns them into commodities. 
The God of the Jews has become secularized and has become the God of the world. The bill of exchange is the real God of the Jew. His God is only an illusory, illusory <laughs> bill of exchange. Yeah, well, let's see who else. Well, here he has another quote um, from the Holy Family, which says basically the same thing, that the task of abolishing the ens essence of Jewry, uh, which means getting rid of the money system. And Edward Bellamy wrote a book back in the turn of the century before that uh, it was like a utopian novel that took place in Boston in like the year, uh, I don't know, it was like in the year 2000 or something, something 2000. And uh, this guy like time travels or something goes to Boston of the future and, it, and they didn't have any money. A lot of these utopian novels didn't have money. In fact, in Utopia, St. Thomas More's Utopia, they uh, didn't have money and uh, everybody lived happily. But uh, here's something that's kind of interesting. This guy named Josephus, who uh, lived through the Jewish war, and this, this relates to the 666 too, because uh, the Jews revolted against Rome in like 66 AD. And it's happy 888 day today, you know? That's great, I love it. Uh, do you remember where you were on 60606? Uh, yeah, like I was, uh, I went to see him. It's my favorite band, and maybe we'll hear some songs from them later. But I went with two friends of mine up to Mesa, and him was playing on uh, 6606 up there. It was the first time I ever heard him, and I like kind of fell in love with him. It was really good. But like, uh, yeah, Josephus was a contemporary of, uh, well, I don't even believe Jesus existed because you know, nobody ever wrote anything about him, and certainly he didn't walk on water, you know. I mean, that's a metaphor. If you look at the whole story, it's like his uh, disciples were out in a boat and they were scared, you know, and so Jesus says, well, if you have faith, you can walk on water. So he's using like a metaphor, and he also says, you know, that you can move mountains. If you have faith, you can move mountains, and then faith grows like a grain of mustard seed and this and that. But, and he also says that your faith will make you whole. It's like, you know, it, it, you have to have a positive attitude. You know, if you think you're sick, you're going to be sick. And that's part of the whole problem with psychiatry is, you know, these psychiatrists will label you as this or that and another thing, you know, and then they'll give you drugs to, to keep you addicted, you know, and keep you trapped in your mind thought that there's something wrong with you. They put this label on you, you know, and, and you begin to believe it and you start acting the part. And then these drugs will just make you worse and worse. I've seen a lot of people you know, that had brilliant minds before they started taking these drugs. And it's kind of like numb them and turn them into like zombies and robots and stuff. And, and like people on Prozac and Xanax and those kind of things have like strange personalities, you know. It's kind of like, uh, you know, a drunk has a personality. Well, these people on uh, Prozac and Xanax and these kind of things have a, a personality. And they make a lot of profit off these drugs, too. I think that, like, you know, if LSD and ecstasy and marijuana were illegal, and uh, then, you know, it would be, uh, people wouldn't need these drugs. They, they, could, they wouldn't need psychiatric drugs, that's for sure. Because you'd realize that, you know, like, when you take LSD, you kind of, like, become one with the world and you see through things. You see how phony a lot of your friends are and you can see your friends as they really are, you know, and, and it'll uh, change your life. A lot of people's lives have changed after they've taken LSD. A lot of famous people have taken LSD too. I have a bunch, um, an LSD, whoops, sorry, wrong button. But they have a, I have an LSD page that lists a whole bunch of famous people that have taken LSD. And like there's this famous baseball uh, pitcher who pitched like a no-hitter on LSD. And then the men who, uh, wrong button again, the men who uh, invented uh, or discovered DNA, uh, the, the, um, the hel helix, you know, they, they uh, Dr. Watson and, uh, what's the name of the other one? Crick, Watson and Crick. I don't remember which one. I think they both took an LSD, but one of them probably took it more than others. Oh. <laughs> oh.